Hey, my name is Matt Johnson. This is the Sony a7 IV, and today I'm going to be reviewing this camera from the perspective of a wedding filmmaker. So if you film weddings and you are considering buying this camera, this video should be very helpful to you. But before I get started, for the sake of ethics, this video is not paid or sponsored by Sony in any way, and they will not see it until it's uploaded, and also this camera is sadly going back to Sony in a few days. Also, because I respect your time, I'm going to spoil the conclusion of this review right now and tell you that the a7 IV is a camera that excels in both photo and video quality, and it also very closely resembles the camera that I love, the a7S III. That is, except for one glaring issue that may be a deal breaker for some of you. That main deal breaker is that the a7 IV is incapable of recording in full frame at higher frame rates than 4K at 30 frames per second. While it is capable of recording in 4K at 60 frames per second, it does it with a super 35mm 1.5 times crop, which, in short, sucks. That said, whenever I filmed a wedding with this camera, I used a wider lens than I typically use to compensate for the crop, and I was easily able to work around it. So, if you have the budget to invest in lenses that will work around this 4K60 crop, and especially if you want a camera that can do photo and video well, I think this is a stellar camera, especially for the price. So, let's get into this actual review now, because I have a lot of thoughts about this camera, and a lot of theories, and it's gonna be fun to talk about. Starting off, as I said in the initial conclusion for this review, this camera shares a ton of similarities with the a7S III, so I'm gonna be referencing my review of that camera a lot. And if you want to watch that review, I'll link it up in the corner and down in the video description. Now, starting off with the build quality, you can actually tell that this is a camera that Sony has tried to save money creating. So that way they can hit a lower price point than the a7S III. And that may make you think that they've gone with a lower quality camera build, but that's actually not true. Instead, to save money, Sony didn't bother at all to come up with an entirely new camera body. Instead, they pretty much straight up copied the a7S III. Yes, the a7 IV has nearly the exact same body and styling as the a7S III. And I'm gonna warn you now, if you have multiple bodies like I do, you better make darn sure that you look at what the camera says on the front and also at the top mode dial before you pick it up, because it's very easy to grab the wrong camera if you don't look closely enough. In the short time that I've had this camera, I found myself reaching for it and then realizing, oh, I actually picked up my A7S III. Wait a second, where's the A7 IV? It happens. It's a ridiculous problem to have, but I do want you to be aware of it. So, back to the build quality then. Because this camera shares so much with the a7S III, this means that it's actually a very well-built, very high-quality camera. You get the same flip-around screen, you get the same great weather ceiling, which, caveat there, the weather ceiling is good as long as you keep the hot shoe cover on. If you want to hear about my a7S III dying from rain and being revived, I'll link to that video in the corner and down in the video description. You also get a full-size HDMI port, just like the a7S III, but I'm warning you, this camera does not support external ProRes RAW recording. That's another thing that helps keep the price down below the a7S III. What else is there? Oh, you also have a USB-C port, which enables you to use the camera as a webcam. This should make for pretty easy live streaming of wedding ceremonies with this camera which is nice. So otherwise, at least as looks go, aside from the badging, the main difference between the body of the a7 IV and the a7S III is that Sony has opted to modify the exposure dial and turn it into just a regular programmable dial, which makes it far more useful. And they've also changed the mode dial at the top. There's now a second dial below the main dial that controls whether the camera is in photo or video mode or slow motion S and Q video mode. I actually love this change because it makes switching between the modes very simple and it's easy to tell at a glance if I'm shooting photo or video. But let's be honest though, I never really shoot photo unless I'm shooting time lapses, so my camera is rarely ever switching from the video mode. Otherwise, like I said, this camera is essentially the same on the outside, so let's now turn our attention inward. No, we're not getting philosophical here. <laughs> I want to talk about the innards of this camera, not the innards of your soul. Because this camera does have some really interesting new features that I really wish that my a7S III had as well. 
First things though, whenever you open up the menu, you're gonna be greeted by the now familiar new Sony menus that are a huge upgrade over previous cameras like the a7 III. In addition, this also means that my a7S III menu and custom button setup video will apply for the most part to the a7 IV as well. So I highly recommend watching that video if you've recently bought this camera and you wanna learn one of the quickest and most efficient ways to set up for filmmaking. It'll also be linked in the corner and the video description. Now, back to the menus. You're going to notice a lot of other familiar things that Sony has pulled from the a7S III. Things like shockless white balance for smooth white balance shifting, which I love. But let's talk about what's new. The first thing you'll notice is that because the a7 IV has a much larger 33 megapixel sensor, it is now capable of using the APS-C crop mode when recording in 4K. Unlike the a7S III, which only has a 12 megapixel sensor and therefore cannot crop in and access APS-C mode when recording in 4K, only when recording in HD, the a7 IV can access APS-C crop mode at any time to enable you to punch in on anything that you're filming. The a7 IV can also access APS-C crop mode whenever you don't want it to either, namely whenever you switch to 4K60, but can you tell I'm a little bitter? Anyways. The next big change for the a7 IV is something that I actually think is pretty dang revolutionary, and I absolutely wish that my a7S III had it as well. If I could ask for like one thing via a firmware update Sony, this is it, okay, give me that. This feature is called Focus Breathing Compensation, and when Sony first told me about it, my jaw was literally dropped. Okay, so here's how it works. Do you remember how some of Sony's lenses have focus breathing? If you've ever used a 35 millimeter GM, I'm sure you've experienced this. This focus breathing is where your lens will get wider or tighter as you change your focus. And this is something that plagues both a lot of Sony's new GM lenses, as well as many lenses from other camera manufacturers as well. And up until now, there really wasn't any way to fix this focus breathing unless you specifically made a point to purchase lenses that had little or no focus breathing. Notice that I said now, because Sony, through a mixture of science and witchcraft, has managed to come up with a way to fix focus breathing with the a7 IV. It's crazy. Now. As a caveat, the way this works is that you have to use Sony native lenses because the camera has to be able to communicate with the lens to do it. But as long as you're using a native Sony lens and you have focus breathing compensation turned on in your camera menu, what the a7 IV is going to do is it's going to know which lens is on it and then it's going to know the amount of focus breathing that that lens exhibits at different focus points. Then the camera is going to use Sony's proprietary clear image zoom technology, which which enables the camera to near losslessly zoom in and out of the image that's being recorded and, in essence, cancel out the focus breathing. This happens in real time, it's instantaneous, and if you're somebody that loves rack focusing, this feature is going to be your new best friend. And so, if you've been thinking about buying one of Sony's lenses, but the fear of focus breathing has been holding you back, if you have an a7 IV, you don't need to worry about that anymore. Focus breathing compensation is going to fix that for you, and it's pretty dang revolutionary. Now, moving on here, closely related to focus breathing, let's talk more about focus, specifically autofocus. And this is another area where the a7 IV has taken a big jump over the a7 III, because the a7 IV has the same autofocus system that is in the a7S III and A1, meaning that you now get not only face detect autofocus, but you also get eye detect autofocus, which is fantastic and scary accurate. So, autofocus is great, but what about manual focus? Wait a second, Matt, this isn't a lens review, this is a camera review. What does manual focus have to do with anything? Well, Sony has actually included a really cool new feature in the a7 IV that's gonna be really helpful to you if you use manual focus lenses. This applies to autofocus lenses as well, but manual focus is really where I think you're gonna see a lot of the benefit. The a7 IV has a new feature called Focus Map, which in essence changes the color of the screen to show you which parts are in focus and which are out of focus. Now, you may be thinking, Matt, Sony cameras already have that. It's called focus peaking, but you're a little wrong because you can think of Focus Map as a highly advanced form of focus peaking. 
See, focus peaking can only tell you the part of your image that's in focus. It cannot measure anything else. Focus map, on the other hand, can measure your focus in 3D space, meaning it's going to artificially color your screen, but the colors are going to coordinate with the in-focus and out-of-focus parts of your image, and it's going to change the color of different parts of the screen depending on whether something is in front of the plane of focus or behind the plane of focus. Objects in the foreground will be orange and red, while objects in the background will be blue. And objects that are perfectly in focus won't have any color at all. You'll just see a normal video. This can be super helpful, especially if you're manual focusing, because you can then tell at a glance if you need to adjust your focus, and the colors are going to help tell you if you need to focus closer or further away. This should be super helpful if you're manual focusing, and also if you're using autofocus with a gimbal, I think this could help as well. Thinking about gimbals and stabilization now, let's talk about IBIS. Just like the a7S III, with the a7 IV, you get standard and active image stabilization mode. Standard mode is the same that you will get from the a7 III, while active mode is going to provide even more stabilization that more closely resembles something like Panasonic or Canon's level of stabilization in the R5, but this active stabilization is going to come at the expense of a 1.1 times crop to any image that you are recording. Now let's talk battery life. The a7 IV uses Sony's newer NPFZ1 100 batteries, the same as the a7 III and the a7S III. I have not had a chance to do any extensive battery life tests, but from my anecdotal experience filming two days of a wedding with this camera, to me, the battery life does feel longer than the a7S III. I don't think it's a monumental difference, but whenever I was filming with the a7 IV while Rachel was filming with the a7S III, I noticed that Rachel was burning through batteries faster than I was. Now, this may have had to do with her taking longer shots or recording more clips, so this is not a super scientific analysis. But in my general opinion, I think that the battery life is better with the a7 IV, and it more closely resembles the very good battery life of the a7 III versus the slightly worse battery life of the a7S III. Another thing you are undoubtedly going to deal with at weddings is low light. Couples love having darker wedding receptions, so having a camera that's capable of handling those low light situations is important. Thankfully, I'm happy to tell you that the a7 IV has very similar, if not better, low light performance than the a7S III. Wait a second, Matt, how does that work out? It's better at least until you get up to ISO 12800. The reason that the a7 IV is better at some of these lower ISOs is that unlike the a7S III, the a7 IV does not have a dual gain ISO sensor. With the a7S III, ISOs 6400 through 10,000 or so actually get quite noisy before the camera hits ISO 12000, where it gets very clean again whenever the dual gain ISO kicks in. Because the a7 IV does not have a dual gain ISO sensor, this means that those lower ISOs up to 10,000 are much cleaner. But once you get above ISO 12,800, that is where the a7S III starts to pull away because it is cleaner. That said though, the a7 IV still pleasantly surprised me because when I was filming the dance floor at this wedding, I was cranking my ISO up to 16,000, 25,600, even 32,000, and it was still very usable even at these high ISOs. So the a7 IV gets my stamp of approval for low light. Don't be afraid to film in the dark with this camera. Now, aside from low light, let's talk about other aspects of image quality because this is an area where the a7 IV is also very similar to the a7S and also a huge upgrade over the a7 III. First, just like the a7S III, this camera now records in 10-bit and it is beautiful. You get fantastic colors and a lot of room to shift and modify them when color grading. Likewise, the a7IV has similar high dynamic range to the a7S III, meaning that if you shoot in a profile like S-Log3, you are going to not only get gorgeous colors, but also gorgeously exposed highlights and shadows. I have an entire video showing how to easily film an S-Log3 that I would highly recommend watching if you buy the a7 IV because that is the picture profile that I would recommend for this camera. I will link to that video up in the corner and down in the video description. Of course though, if you don't want to film an S-Log3, I'm also very happy to tell you that this camera also includes Sony's S-Cinetone picture profile which can give you a great image straight out of camera. 
Also, I've created a set of video presets called Who is Matt Lutz that I've specifically tuned to work with mini picture profiles, including S-Slog3 and S-Cinetone. And I've tested these LUTs with A7 IV footage and they make it look awesome. I will link to Who is Matt Lutz down below if you wanna check them out. Now, we've made it to arguably one of the most important parts of this review. We need to talk about the good and the bad whenever it comes to video formats and frame rates with this camera. First off, the good news. Exactly like the a7S III and A1, the a7 IV is capable of recording in XAVC-S, XAVC-HS, and XAVC-SI formats with the same bit rates. So you're going to get very high quality footage with this camera, and I'm glad that Sony did not skimp on this. In more good news, if you choose to record in 4K at 24 or 30 frames per second, the a7 IV will oversample a 7K image down to 4K in camera, which means your footage is going to look super sharp. Plus, if you choose to record in 4K 60, the camera will also oversample a 4.6K image for it, so that can look pretty sharp too. Now, ready for the bad news? Okay. The bad news is that Sony has chosen to crop the sensor whenever you record in 4K at 60 frames per second. Instead of recording in full frame, the a7 IV will record with a 1.5 times crop, meaning that your 24 millimeter lens will become a 36 millimeter lens and your 50 millimeter lens will become a 75 millimeter lens, etc., etc. This feels like a big step back to me because if there's one thing that I've been hearing filmmakers ask for years, it's that they want a camera that is capable of recording 4K at 60 frames per second in full frame. The a7S III gave us that, but what hurts is that it really feels like this crop on the a7 IV is an artificial limitation that's meant to keep people buying the a7S III. When Sony first showed the a7 IV to me, they talked about how they wanted to keep the quality of the footage as high as possible with no pixel binning in 4K60, hence the 1.5 times crop. But at the same time, Sony has also shown that they're okay with making cameras like the A1 that can record in full frame 4K at 60 frames per second, even with pixel binning and no crop, and the image quality is still quite good. You can tell me if I'm crazy in the comments down below, but I'm betting that most filmmakers want a camera that records in 4K at 60 frames per second without a crop, even if it's pixel binned. So, why is Sony doing this? Why have they chosen to crop this camera in 4K60? It's not overheating, which I know you may be thinking, but Sony has said they're using the exact same cooling system that's found in the a7S III in the a7 IV. So it should definitely easily be able to handle 4K at 60 frames per second for as long as you want it to record. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to test the overheating because it started to get cooler here in Texas, but I will tell you that whenever I filmed a wedding with this camera, I had zero issues with any overheating even when recording in 4K60 often throughout the day. So with that, here's my theory for why the a7 IV is cropped in 4K60. My theory goes back to the a7 III because I feel like Sony knows they screwed up a bit with that camera because they made it too good. The a7 III came out after the a7S II, but it wasn't necessarily meant to be better than it. But what happened is the a7 III ended up cannibalizing a lot of the sales of the a7S II because it was way too close in quality and even better in many ways. I think that Sony doesn't want to make the same mistake with the a7 IV and the a7S III, so they've intentionally made a big difference between the two cameras by making the 4K60 on the a7 IV have a crop. This way, you look at the a7 IV and then you look at that a7S III, and if you want that full frame 4K60, you gotta pony up some more cash for the a7S III. And in a Sony vacuum, or if they were the only company making cameras, this artificial limitation makes sense. But other camera companies exist. It feels like Sony is ignoring that their biggest competitor, Canon, has the R6 for a similar price that includes 4K60 in full frame. Now, I am much less concerned about overheating with the a7 IV versus the R6, but Canon has been aggressive about firmware updates to improve the overheating of that camera, and while it's still not enough for me to recommend the R6, it is much improved over whenever the camera launched. And then you look at Panasonic, and they're like, 
What overheating? Granted, they've had cropped 4K60 with their S1 and S1H cameras since 2019, but I have zero doubt that their next full frame camera that they release will be recording at minimum 4K60 in full frame. Now, back to the a7 IV versus the a7S III. Even if the a7 IV and a7S III both had 4K at 60 frames per second in full frame, the a7S III is still capable of going far beyond that by recording 4K at 120 frames per second, which I feel like is a sizable enough change that would differentiate the a7S III from the a7 IV but that's just my opinion. Regardless, all this talk of super 35 millimeter crop and 4K60 is just that, talk. Because if you invest in the a7 IV and fully know what you're getting into, you can prepare and work around it. Whenever Sony sent me this camera, I knew about the crop. And so for the wedding I had coming up, I knew I would need wider lenses. When I film weddings, I'm usually either on a 24 or 50 millimeter prime lens because I knew that I would be shooting a significant portion of the wedding in 4K60 with this 1.5 times crop though, I chose to borrow a friend's 16 to 35 F2.8 GM lens because that suddenly gave me a lens that at 16 millimeter would become 24 millimeter with the crop and at 35 millimeter would become 52.5 millimeter at the crop. So I was effectively able to offset the crop and mimic my 24 and 50 millimeter lenses with this one lens. And this is where things get really interesting because I went into this wedding thinking that I was gonna be consistently aware of the crop and need to work around it. But what's weird is that with this wider lens, I didn't find myself thinking about the crop all that often. Instead, all I had to do was remember that if I switched to shooting in 4K60, I needed to make sure that I set the lens to 16 millimeter. And if I wanted a tighter shot that mimics my 50 millimeter, I would zoom the lens in all the way. And once I started using this wider lens and stopped thinking about the crop, I was amazed at how similar the a7 IV felt to the a7S III. I was getting many of the same exact shots that I get with the a7S III. The bitrate was the same, the video formats were the same, the colors were the same, same dynamic range, heck, the body was the same. This camera feels eerily similar to the a7S III, and this is a very good thing. So let me put it this way. I went into filming a wedding with the a7 IV thinking that I was going to be annoyed and really struggle with using it, but within an hour, it felt completely natural and I was very happy to use this camera. And honestly, if you told me that I had to shoot more weddings with the a7 IV or there wasn't an a7S III anymore, I wouldn't be upset. I could still easily work with it and I think you could too. Now, big crop talk over. I've been positive, I've been negative. Let's end on a happy note with some good news. The first piece of good news that I have for you has to do with memory cards for this camera. Flip open the card slot door on the side and you are going to see a difference between the a7S III and the a7 IV. You still get dual card slots, but unlike the a7S III, which has card slots that do double duty and accept both SD cards and CF Express Type A cards, the a7 IV, on the other hand, has one card slot that will accept SD cards and CF Express cards, while the second card slot will only accept SD cards. I assume this is a way to keep the price down, and you're probably thinking, Matt, how is this good news? Well, it's good news because regardless of which frame rate or bit rate or format that you choose to record in, all of them are recordable to SD cards. Yes, you do not need to spend any extra money buying a CF Express Type A card for this camera. You can record everything to normal, affordable SD cards. And more than that, you don't even need to spend a lot of money on super fast V90 SD cards. Because the a7 IV can only record it up to 4K at 60 frames per second, you can actually get by recording 4K at 60 FPS to normal, very affordable V30 SD cards. Now. Speaking about saving money, not only with SD cards, let's wrap up this review by talking about the price of this camera. Unfortunately, Sony has not revealed to me the exact price, but they said it was gonna be somewhere between $2,500 and $2,800. I don't think this is a bad price, especially whenever you consider the competition, but I do think that it's close enough to the a7S III at 3,500 that I think you're gonna to need to heavily consider which one of these cameras to buy. And that brings us to the conclusion of this video. As I said at the start, in the first conclusion, the a7 IV is clearly a hybrid camera that excels with high photo and video quality. And from the general build to the overall quality of the footage that you can get from this camera, it's very similar to my 
favorite camera of all time, the a7S III. And when I filmed a wedding with the a7 IV, I quickly found myself forgetting I was using a cheaper camera than the a7S III. So should you buy the a7 IV? If you are a photographer who wants a hybrid camera that can shoot photo and video, I think the a7 IV is a better choice than the a7S III because it has nearly triple the megapixels. And for video, as long as you have some wider lenses for 4K60, like the 16 to 35 GM, you should be good to go. Also, if you already own an A7S III and you're considering buying a second body to use as a wedding ceremony camera or backup, I think that the a7 IV is a good choice as well. That crop in 4K60 might actually be useful during a wedding ceremony where you're stuck in the balcony half a mile from the couple. But if you're primarily a filmmaker and you don't already own an a7S III and you rarely find yourself taking photos, if you can afford the extra money for the a7S III, having 4K60 and 4K120 in full frame is incredibly nice to have, and I think it makes the a7S III completely worth it over the a7IV. Lastly, what if you're on a budget or you're just getting into filmmaking and $2,500-ish is too much to ask? In that case, I would look at the a7 III or a7C. They're still great cameras with a lot of great features, and at $1,800 to 2000 bucks, they're also much more affordable. Plus, we can hope that Sony will drop the price with the a7 IV releasing. With that, thank you so much for watching this review of the Sony a7 IV. It would be a huge help to me if you'd consider liking this video and subscribing if you wanna see more videos about filmmaking in the future. In addition, if you shoot Sony, or any other camera brand for that matter, and you want better colors, in your videos. I would highly recommend checking out my Who Is Matt Lutz color presets. They work very well with all the cameras I've talked about today. Lastly, if you happen to be a wedding filmmaker like me, considering this is a camera review for wedding filmmakers, you probably want to book more couples and film more weddings, and I would love to help you out with that. I've created a free guide that's going to walk you through some practical steps that you can take right now in your business to book more couples and film more weddings. It's a completely free gift to you. You can download it at the link down in the video description. Thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.